Tom, good to see you again. Thanks for coming in. Kristen, thank you for having me. Yeah, last time we talked was a year and a half ago. At the time, you were pouring millions of your own money into California propositions, and we were asking the question, are you going to run for senator, governor, the president? And now you've announced you're not doing any of those things. So what are you doing? So in 2018, we are, I mean, we're a grassroots organization at Next Gen America. And one of the things we're doing is we are doing grassroots organizing for young voters, people under 35. So we're in 31 congressional districts on the ground right now, have been since last fall. 10 of those congressional districts are in California. So for once, California is at the heart of the national political debate and the national political battle, as opposed to being the place people assume is going to be democratic and will supply money for the rest of the country's political contests. This year, we're right at the heart of the contest. You just announced you're putting $30 million into the midterm elections and supporting certain candidates and getting the young people to vote. Why do you believe it all centers on getting the young people to vote? Well, the largest age cohort in the United States is people under 35. That generation is bigger than the baby boom generation. They vote at about half the rate of other American citizens. They also happen to be the most diverse generation in American history, and they're the most progressive generation in American history. So we believe that for us to have a successful functioning democracy, we need the underrepresented groups in our society to participate the way everybody else does, so that we, people are considered fairly, so that their voices are heard, so that their interests are taken into account. And young people are dramatically underrepresented in our democracy, and we're doing everything we can to get them registered, to get them engaged in the process, and to turn out at the polls. How much of this is based on, obviously, you've put a lot of resources behind what are considered progressive issues, the climate, uh, women's issues and empowerment, um, typically associated with the left. And young people are more likely to vote that way. In the 2016 presidential elections, the millennials went for Hillary Clinton versus Trump. How much of that is actually behind what you're doing here? Well, let me say this. We do believe in this generation. We believe that they're informed, we believe they're passionate on the issues, and we believe that if they trust the system and believe that it will work for them, that they can change the country. So when you think about what you just said in terms of progressive issues, climate, we accept science. That doesn't seem progressive to me, if you'll excuse my saying so. <laughs> Treating women equally. I, it's hard for me, Kristen, to look you in the face and say, that's a progressive issue. That seems to me to be in 2018, treating every American equally, respecting their rights and treating them with dignity. That seems like something we shouldn't have to be fighting for, but we do. So do I, that's an issue. If we, when we go on campus, we give the students a card asking them to check off the issues that they take really seriously. And the number two issue that they always come up with is racial justice and equality. And I think when they're talking about that, they're talking about that more broadly, including gender justice. Mm -hmm. So yes, this is a generation that has real patriotism, that has real values, that we share with them, and we're hoping that they get represented and have their voices be heard. Have you seen any evidence yet that all your efforts have paid off in terms of youth voter registration and participation? Well, let me give you two examples. In 2016, which you referenced before, we did the largest voter registration drive in California history. We registered 807,000 Californians. Over 350,000 of them were under the age of 35. So yes, and if you look at what happened in California in 2016, you saw an incredible success for Democrats and progressive ideas. That's one point where I'd say, yes, we, that was an absolute clear success that when they show up, their voice is incredibly significant. The second thing I'd say is we did the organizing of young voters in Virginia in 2017. Oddly enough, Virginia is one of the very few states that has their governor's race and their statewide elections the year after the presidency. No, not, not in the mid-year like 2018, mm -hmm. but in 2017. 
We organized the young voters there. The turnout was up 32% from four years before. And the spread between Democrats and Republicans went from 5%, 52 to 47 for those voters, to 39%, 69 to 30. So we know that when those young voters are organized, when they hear the arguments, when they understand, and this is a huge point, how important their participation is and that they can make such a huge difference, then we know that they're, they can make a just dramatic difference. And they certainly did in Virginia, and they certainly did in California a year and a half ago. Do you think recent events have also galvanized the youth in terms of their <laughs> political participation? I mean, case in point is the March for Our Lives recently, huge turnout across the country. Of course it is. Of course it is. And I think it reflects exactly what the issue is with young voters. So if you think about the response to the tragedy at Parkland, we had young voters saying, there is an obvious truth here. We need to be protected. The elected officials are not doing their job to protect us because they are kowtowing to the very large and corrupt organization called the National Rifle Association. And as a result of that, they're unwilling to do things to protect the lives of young Americans. And if they don't do that, we're going to raise our voices, we're going to march, and we're going to vote them out of office. And what that reflects to me is what we hear every single day from young voters. This system is not responsive to us. It's corrupt. These adults are not doing their jobs because they're, in fact, being corrupted by money from the right. And so, yes, our whole goal in this is to enable that kind of broad democracy that Parkland represents. And in fact, we said we're going to spend an extra million dollars just rep registering high school students. So as much as we loved and supported their voice, we want to make sure their votes are counted in November, too. All right, speaking of the influence of money in elections, there are some that would argue you putting your own money and vast resources into elections, whether it's propositions or candidates, um, is that something that uh, you can argue one way as well and say, wow, he's got undue influence? Well, let me say this. We are absolutely opposed to the way money works in American politics. We think it's corrupting and unfair. And so we're, I'm very aware about the irony. But let me explain to you why, why, the way that we're trying to do this in the most high-minded and patriotic way. So first of all, what we're really doing in every single instance is to produce more democracy. We're trying to engage young people to make sure that they're involved, educated, and participating. Because we believe that the broadest democracy is the best democracy. Second of all, we're very transparent about it. I'm sitting here talking to you in a TV studio. I'm explaining to you what we do. We're trying to make sure that there's no you know, secret agenda here. We're trying to represent a broader democracy in everything we do, and we're willing to explain how we're doing it. And the third thing is this. Everything we do in our estimate is to try and represent the vast bulk of American citizens. There's no instance where we're doing something which would redound to my benefit. Mm -hmm. We're not sitting here and saying you should be supporting fossil fuel interests. We're not sitting here saying you should be supporting technology interests. There's nothing in here, and we've been scrupulous and, you know, in my opinion, as clean as anyone could ever be to make sure that people realize we're just doing this in the public interest. Would you support the kind of campaign finance reform that may eventually make it impossible for you to run the super PAC that you have? Of course I would. I'd love that. The fact of the matter is the money in politics is corrupting. We've, but the, uh, the other truth of the fact is this is the system that we have. These are the laws that the Supreme Court approved. So from my standpoint, I love the American democracy. I know it's imperfect. We have to live within the rules that the Supreme Court and the Congress sets up, and that's exactly what we're doing. But when we disagree with them, we're trying to go way beyond the law to make sure that what we're doing is high-minded, is patriotic, and is in the general good. 
All right, let's talk a little bit about your need to impeach Trump campaign. You've put considerable resources into running ads across the country talking about the need to impeach President Trump. And you really came up with this even before the Mueller Russian indictments. Uh, are you seeing now, as a result of what's happened recently, as a proof that you started on a track that you needed to go down? Well, we started, we started the campaign on October 20th. And I felt very strongly at that point that this was a lawless, reckless, and dangerous president. And I think that there was a ton of evidence on October 20th that all of that was true and that he was a threat to our democracy and a threat to the health and safety of the American people. And I think, and, but we also knew, or we believed strongly, that every single subsequent day, including today, would be a day where new evidence would show that what we originally said was true. And so Mr. Mueller had not indicted anyone. No one had pled guilty. His investigation was completely silent. But we knew stuff would come out of that. We, st we know more stuff will come out of that. We don't know what it is. We know that Mr. Trump will do more reckless, lawless activity. We know that. Do we know exactly what it is? No, but this is a president who is a danger to the American people. And the remedy that the people who wrote the Constitution gave us was impeachment. And so we believe this is the most important issue facing the American people because it touches every other issue. At the time when you started this campaign, there were suspicions of collaboration with the Russians by some in his campaign to influence the election. Uh, now, the latest headlines involve his dalliances sexually, romantically with other people uh, who are not his wife. Um, how do you think that plays into all this? Is that something that you view as separate from the call for impeachment? Well, it's funny. My feeling about all of those things, there's never one cockroach. When you see someone who, has, who is willing to break the rules in terms of the election campaign, if you see someone who's willing to break the rules in terms of the, the laws about conducting business, if you see someone who is not, who tells, according to the Washington Post, 2,500 lies as president in his first year in office, then I think you have somebody who is deeply untrustworthy. And if you then see his personal life reflecting what would seem to me to be disregard and disrespect for human beings, whether it's his wife, whether it's the women that he's involved with, when you have 14 women claiming you've sexually harassed them, there's never one cockroach. The fact of the matter is what we're seeing is what I said, a reckless, dangerous, and lawless man who is, go who is a threat to the American people and a threat to the American democracy. And the only way we'll stop him is if the American people put their voices together and insist that he be stopped. So the impeach Trump campaign will continue and the ads will continue. Absolutely. All right. And you are the narrator of the ads. I mean, you are on camera speaking to the American people, which leads some to ask, are you still trying to elevate your own political profile? What do you think? I would say, I would go back to the way that I described what we're trying to do politically. I understand that people could be concerned about someone doing something in the shadows. And I've always tried to be as transparent as possible. I'm sitting here explaining to you exactly what we're trying to do. And that's what we're doing in the ad. If you're going to go out and try and organize the voices of the American people to call for impeachment, it seems to me that you should have the candor and the honesty to look them in the eye and say, I really think this, I think we should do this together. We need, if it's gonna happen, it's gonna happen because we all do it and not do it as some kind of secret campaign where no one really knows what's behind it. I wanna ask you today, former Vice President Joe Biden endorsed Senator Feinstein. And uh, do you agree with that? And do you think California or perhaps the nation needs new democratic leadership? Well, let me say this, I and next gen America, the organization that, that uh, I founded, has tried to avoid in the past too often endorsing anybody in a Democrat versus Democrat race. Because we always felt like, let's leave it up to the people. Let's give them as much information. You know, you, you were, let's enable forums. Let's sponsor debates. Let's go door to door and talk to people. But let's trust the voters to make a good decision. 
So from my standpoint, when I look at California and when I look at Dianne Feinstein and Kevin DeLeon, I can see dramatic differences between the candidates. And sometimes when there are dramatic differences, we choose to make an endorsement. But when I look at the Democratic Party in the United States of America, what I'm looking for is candor, the willingness to look forward and think in visionary terms, not incremental terms, and an absolute commitment to the truth. And that's, what, that's how, how I'm looking at that race, and that's how I'm looking at every other race. That's what I believe we need to do if we're going to do a good job for the American people, which is to be absolutely honest and to be willing to, to say, there are cha we need change, goodness gracious. This is not a time for incremental change. We have been taken over by a radical right-wing group that is dominating every level of American policy and, and politics, and in my mind, attacking our democracy and the American people. This is not a time for incremental change. So your time is running out, not mine. So I will ask you two questions before you get out of here, because this is of great interest to me. Number one, how do you plan to engage young people? What is the way to get through the, to them? Is it social media? What is it? Well, we do a bunch of different things, including social media. I mean, if you think about California, we're going to be on campuses, setting up tables, and talking to them about the issues that they care the most about. And we, check, we, we give them all cards to ask them, what are the issues you, t you care about? So it's engaging them on the issues. As much as possible, face to face, Almost everyone in our organization is, is a young person under 35 years old, so it's peers talking to each other. But we also know that most young people aren't going to a residential college, so we are scrupulous about spending an enormous amount of time on the community colleges around California, which is a system that is vast, bigger than the UCs, bigger than the CSUs by far, and where many few people go to, fewer people go to organize. The other thing, though, is we know that there are an awful lot of young people who are definitely not in community college or CSU or UC. So for those people, we're trying really hard to contact them through social media. We use mail, snail mail. We, you know, we do everything we can to encourage them to participate, to get information to them, and to try and make sure that they understand how important their participation really is for everybody, including themselves. Have you ruled out running for president yourself someday? <laughs> Well, let me say this. I was saying a couple of minutes ago how much trouble the Democratic Party is in. If you look, Republicans control the White House, the Congress, the Senate, the Supreme Court, 35 out of 50 governorships, and an equal number of state, state houses. Democrats don't control anything. We control a few states. We're, you know, doing very well in California, but overwhelmingly, the United States is dominated by Republicans. We are seeing an absolute, in my mind, fight for the soul of America in 2018. It's that big. Everyone else seems to think this is a normal year. This is so far from a normal year. This is, we are in crisis, and November 6th, which is election day, we are absolutely head down until November 6th, because we don't know what's gonna happen then. The pollsters were sure Hillary would win. Wrong. They've been wrong about every single election since 2014. So you're asking a specific question, and my point is, I wouldn't even think about that question until we know where we stand on November 6th, because it could be worse. Something big will happen this election day, and we don't know what it is. We could be a lot, we could be somewhat better off, but we can't be, I mean, we just can't undo all that damage in one day. We could be worse off. And I don't think anyone can tell you where we are. So from my standpoint, everybody who's concerned, which should be every American citizen, should be head down until November 6th. And then if they want to think about after that, that's fine. But the fact of the matter is, when you're in that kind of do or die struggle, it seems to me to be looking past it and saying, OK, I, you know, I'm going to figure out how this works, I think that's wrong. I think that anyone who's doing that who's looking past 2018 is doing a disservice to the American, to his fellow or her fellow Americans. And it, it, I think that that's improper, to be honest. All right. Heads down. Everybody get to work. Okay, Tom Steyer, thanks for coming here. <laughs> Good to see you.